Patrick Jackson is based in Ireland, but he used to be uh, with us here in Japan for some time. He is an author of many ELT materials, including very popular series here in Japan, Potato Pals and Everybody Up, among others. Um, he's also very into environmental education, which I'm sure he will speak about in his presentation today. So Patrick, I will go ahead and turn the floor over to you. So please everybody enjoy. Thank you very much, Joshua. And uh, thank you very much, Phil. And thank you very much to JALT for this invitation and to Oxford University Press for this chance to share my story with you. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Perfect, wonderful. Just checking before I go on a one hour uh, adventure on my own. Um, thanks to everybody for tuning in from wherever you are. I mean, incredibly exciting to be able to uh, talk to everybody like this, a real magical power that we've developed that we should never take for granted. And uh, the role that this pandemic has played in supercharging this power, it's some sort of consolation to come out of all this disruption and sadness. Um, I hope that you've all coped and found ways to help others near you to cope, including, of course, your students. Um, I do believe uh, that we are now in the home stretch with this and there will there is light at the end of the tunnel and what a month for good news this uh, has been uh, November 2020 I know 2020 has been synonymous with with terrible news but uh, I think November will will go down as good news November from from now on um, I'm talking to you from my mother's living room in Dublin uh, my little dog Frosty is here curled up uh, he would rather be outside exploring the wider world. It's still dark um, and uh, yes, everybody is asleep upstairs. And so uh, if I'm a little bit hushed, please forgive me if I'm not uh, uh, roaring this out. I would love to have been in Japan uh, with you. And I remember JALT and the fun and the parties. Uh, well, I kind of remember the parties, but I remember they were fun. My talk was called the 25 year lunch, but uh, it should really have been called the 50 year lunch. In fact, I've changed it and you'll be pleased to hear this as it means you're getting double the value. I'll be sharing my own experience on the receiving end of education, which was about uh, 25 years of that, and then uh, on the giving out end of education. So my talk is going cheap today, special offer, Black Friday offer. So what has been the key takeaway from these five decades in education that I feel that I would like to share with you today? I think it's about being our best selves and best educators and how we can be that best self. And I think we need to be more like pizza ovens and we need to find that passion in ourselves that is that light. And we need to share that light with our students and with other teachers, of course. If you've already found this light and you're already sharing it, and I'm preaching to the converted, you're one of the lucky ones. Well done. Celebrate it and keep sharing it with the world, to other teachers and to your students. I wish I had understood this um, when I was teaching in Japan. I wish I had understood all of this sooner because I would have been a much better teacher, but better late than sorry. So some important background that qualifies me to talk at JALT at all. I came from a brewing family. My father and both of my grandfathers worked for the Guinness Company. My maternal grandfather was actually the Guinness doctor. And I know this sounds like an oxymoron, uh, but um, yes, the Guinness, uh, fam the Guinness family have always looked after their employees very well. And we had kegs of Guinness delivered to the house. So the smell of that delicious and health giving beverage permeates my childhood and quite a lot of my adult life too. But this is not a promotional talk for Guinness. My earliest memory, I wonder what your earliest memory was, your earliest memory of, of news. Um, uh, you can uh, uh, write it in the chat. I'm not looking at the chat, but uh, feel free to, to pop that in there. Um, your earliest memory of something uh, on the news. Well, for me, my earliest memory was the moon landing in July of 1969. I was two and a half years old at the time, and I remember the fuss around uh, the, the moon landing and people uh, sort of talking about that 
uh, and not surprisingly. And for me, not long after that, small step for a man, I made a giant leap into education and I went to the Children's House Montessori School. When I first arrived at the Children's House, I had the distinction of being the only pupil in the school who was still wearing nappies. I would also bring my favorite food for lunch, which was a type of baby food, pureed pears. These came in a glass baby food jar and they were absolutely delicious. But for some reason, they brought ridicule from my classmates. So they and the nappies were soon left behind. You must never underestimate the power of peer pressure on, uh, on, on your students. And uh, in my case, it was actually peer pressure. But um, at the children's house, I threw myself wholeheartedly into the pioneering work of the early 20th century Italian physician and educator, Maria Montessori. Her beliefs in the importance of practical activities, whole child health, self-directed learning, etc., all chimed perfectly with my own instincts as a three-year-old. It was so cool. We could do what we liked and follow our own fledgling passions around the room. My own particular passion was for maps and globes, and I did the world jigsaw puzzle over and over again. I was that kid in the corner doing the jigsaw puzzle of the world map, and I knew all the countries and their capitals when I was quite young. I was that kid, that was my thing. There was something else that made the children's house Montessori absolutely unique, possibly in all of education. It was located in the grandstand of a race course in Bal Doyle, unfortunately, which has been demolished since then. Um, but this uh, race course was obviously uh, busy at the weekends, but not so during the week. So they rented it out to the, the, the children's house. Now we were allowed out of the classroom on the day after race meetings, and we were um, got to pick up the discarded betting slips that covered the ground, these tickets, uh, which people obviously, when they lost, they just threw away. And uh, so we were sent out and we, we, we went around picking up all these, uh, these slips. And I remember that so clearly. And um, I think probably that's why I got into environmental, uh, environmental education because of this early experience between the ages of three and five. Of course, the good times at the race course couldn't last forever. And at the age of eight, I was sent in my family tradition, a strange tradition of sending the children away to boarding school. I was sent to the uh, rather depressing boarding school called Castle Park Preparatory School. And it was actually on the other side of Dublin Bay from where we lived. The school motto was mens sana in corpore sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. And this mean, meant running around a lot outside in the cold. Um, this was the very first verse of the school song. Um, please notice this uh, Japanese element in the educational philosophy, which was, uh, yes, to avoid bringing shame uh, to anybody. Um, Castle Park, as I said, was a boarding school. I was actually luckier than a lot of kids because I could see my house from school um, with a telescope. I could see across Dublin Bay um, from Dorkey to Hoth and uh, although there were seven miles of water and a busy shipping lane, it was some consolation. My stepbrother, who had gone to the same school 10 years before me, had actually been so unhappy there, he had uh, gone down to the local harbour and tried to steal a boat in order to get across Dublin Bay. The headmaster of Castle Park, uh, we used to call Boss, and he used to motivate us with what was called a blowing up. And a blowing up involved him shouting at us incredibly loud from point blank range, which was extremely frightening, not just for the child being blown up, but because it was so loud, everybody in the entire school could hear when somebody else was bl being blown up. So we lived in this sort of uh, environment of, of fear. Funnily enough, uh, when I was on holiday in Sligo during this time in 1979, I was actually in the, um, I was actually in a canoe uh, about half a mile away from where Lord Mountbatten was blown up uh, in, his, in his boat, but he was blown up for real. So um, yes, 
This is a uh, tennis shoe, as you can see. And when a blowing up was not good enough to correct our behavior, Boss would motivate us by beating us with this tennis shoe, uh, which was a Dunlop green stripe. I remember it well. Uh, this was presumably to go with the whole uh, healthy mind in a healthy body thing. I was beaten three times in my first term at Castle Park. I remember them well, all three times at night and all three times for the same thing, which was talking in the dormitory after lights out. I was clearly a quick learner, but I just loved talking and I loved talking in the dormitory and I loved talking after lights out, but I was just very bad at not getting caught. The first time that I was beaten, I was so frightened that I wet my pajama bottoms in his office um, and made a big puddle on his carpet. He beat me anyway. That stain remained there for the entire five years I was at the school. It was probably, that stain is probably still there now. Beatings were fairly arbitrary. I have met people since then who have told me the reasons that they were beaten um, by boss, including somebody who was beaten for sneezing. But the saddest of all was the boy who was beaten for diagonally putting the stamp on his letter home. And then after the address, he had put the earth, the solar system, Milky Way, the universe. So he was beaten. What a way to stamp out budding creativity. This is the second verse of the Castle Park song. So that Castle Park may be glad we ever came here and proud to write our name here when we've gone and left our mark. And I'm proud to say that I did leave my mark on that carpet. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. We also had a nature club at Castle Park that used to meet in the afternoons. Um, and uh, we loved the nature club. And I remember the nature club very well, although it was a bit gruesome when Boss brought in some birds he had shot in his garden. So the nature club then became known as the butcher club. There was even a Japan connection at Castle Park. Once a week, a Japanese teacher came to our art classes. She was, she was called Mrs. Origami, or maybe that wasn't her real name, but that's what we thought her name was. And she was very kind to us. I remember her kindness. After five years at Castle Park, it was time for me to go across the sea uh, again, but not just the Dublin Bay. This was across the Irish Sea to continue my education um, in England to a place where I couldn't see home, even with a telescope. Marlborough College boasts many creative alumni, including three children's laureates. Um, most recently, Cressida Cowell, who wrote How to Train Your Dragon. But our most famous alumni of all is Kate Middleton, who achieved so much when she, um, when she married King William to be. Um, Yes, these, this map of the college shows all the places we used to smoke cigarettes uh, marked with numbers. Marlborough College boasts many creative alumni. Yes, as I said. And our housemaster followed an educational philosophy, which was called the Johnny Walker method. This involved him sitting in his study most of the time, drinking whiskey and smoking his pipe. So we followed his lead and we did the same in our own studies. Whiskey was a little strong for us though and expensive, so we had to do with making our own beer and brewing it in an attic in a dustbin with a six day turnaround from start to finish. We sold this beer to all the other students for a big markup and invested the profits in really good beer like Guinness. Although this was completely against the rules of the school, I now appreciate that Brewing beer was the most fantastic cross-curricular activity. In fact, it's pure clill, really, if you think about it. It requires physics, chemistry, biology, maths. Uh, it, it involves uh, in understanding the market, the economics. We needed business strategy. We needed sales and marketing and design skills for the labels. It even crossed into the architecture and engineering and history as we climbed around uh, in amongst the beams and rafters of the 200 year old attic where we had our brewery. So there was place for PE as well, even because we used to have to often run away from teachers and running away was really our thing. 
we love to get out of the school completely. We used to escape during the night and walk across the countryside or cycle. And on one famous night, we walked all the way uh, across the wheat fields under the moonlight to the Neolithic Avebury Stone Circle. We arrived at dawn and hitchhiked back to school before breakfast, unnoticed, except for the fact that the person who stopped to pick us up was one of our teachers. He never told anybody though. There were also great after-school clubs at Marlborough. These were usually led by teachers who had a passion for the subject. I was a member of the Lewis Carroll Society, which was led by a Mr. Whiting. My love for Lewis Carroll has lasted all these years. If you haven't already, please read The Hunting of the Snark. I think uh, in my case, my writing uh, for kids uh, has its roots in the time that Mr. Whiting gave up his time uh, to set up that Lewis Carroll club. There was also a peace society, which was set up by the Reverend Marsh. And this encouraged us to get involved in the anti-nuclear campaigns of the day. In this image, you can see Benedict Ramsbottom and I challenging Margaret Thatcher and the powers that be from in front of the door of our brewery. And there was also a teacher who one day came into class with a ladle and he held this ladle up in front of us. Um, and he said, look at this, look at this, everybody. And we, we sort of giggled and sniggered at the back. And he said, no, no, look at this ladle, isn't it beautiful? Um, and we were like, yeah, he's finally lost it. Um, but he showed us the ladle and he enthused about it and he showed us uh, the beautiful design and he showed us the silver marks on the, on, the, on the handle. And he explained to us how with the silver marks you could identify where the ladle was made and uh, you could identify who had made the ladle, label, uh, the ladle and, and when. And uh, he passed the ladle round and, and we all looked at it and uh, sort of waved it around. And, and he said, uh, this ladle used to belong to my grandmother and, and my grandmother's grandmother and, uh, and my grandmother's grandmother. No, and uh, he said uh, uh, then, and he taught us about the Georgian house that this ladle would have been in. And I remember that ladle now, and that must be 35 years ago. Um, I can't actually remember who the teacher was. So uh, please do this, bring, uh, bring your ladle to class and show your students your, your things. Um, and share with them because they'll remember them, uh, even if they've long forgotten you. After Marlborough, uh, I took a year off. And uh, in my year off, I, I, I finally managed to dive into that world map. And I went out on my own adventure. And I hitchhiked to India uh, via Pakistan and Iran. These are some of the benefits of having an Irish passport. The Iranians were big fans of, of Irish Republicans at that time, so I received a warm welcome everywhere. Uh, I can remember that year of traveling uh, more vividly than any other year in my life. And why was that? Because of the novelty of it and because of the passion and because of the adventure. Um, so it was time to go to university and uh, I was, uh, very fortunate to be able to go and study history at Lincoln College, Oxford. Um, this was an amazing opportunity, as everybody told me. It was also Dr. Seuss's old college. So I threw myself into the social life of the college and I acted in a couple of plays. Um, my performance in Much Ado About Nothing was actually uh, reviewed in the local newspaper as painful to watch. Um, I couldn't concentrate on my course very well because I really wanted to be in Pakistan. So I asked for time off to reassess the situation and they agreed and they said, you can go, uh, go for a year, take a year off, think about what you want to do. So I went straight back to Pakistan and spent another year there, uh, another wonderful year. And then it was time for me to go back. And so I went back to Oxford ready to really knuckle down this time. And my, my motivation really was so as not to upset my mother. However, within two weeks, I'd hit the same wall again. Um, and, and I'm afraid I dropped out again and went straight back to Pakistan. And the truth was, 
I had a passion for Pakistan. I had a passion for the mountains and the big, hot, bustling cities of Lahore, Islamabad, Peshawar, and high places, and the open road and hitchhiking on Pathan trucks. I couldn't get enough of the freedom and the adventure and the characters I met along the way and the quick friendships that you can make on the road. That was really what I wanted to be doing. Um, now, of course, this has slightly haunted me over the years uh, to have dropped out of Oxford twice, uh, because really, if I'd been truly committed, I would have just dropped out once. And the only really um, sort of educationally incisive thing I can take from it um, is that we shouldn't, un uh, we shouldn't, we should never underestimate um, that if a student is not in the right frame of mind to be there, what follows that can be disruptive and sometimes self-destructive. And that was the same for me as it is for a five-year-old Akaiwa student. In my case, what chance did essays about the Crusades have against the level of excitement I could find somewhere else? And uh, even now, I don't really sit down uh, well and like sitting down and studying. So, um, yes, actually, incidentally, Dr. Seuss didn't finish his degree at Lincoln College either. Um, and maybe that was because his father was a brewer as well. The following years, um, which my family called the lost years, consisted of me taking up various occupations, usually for a few months at a time. I was a pillow manufacturer, a painter, a parrot dealer, a kitchen porter, and a prawn fisherman, and finally a waiter in an all-night transvestite-themed restaurant called Mr. Pussy's, owned by the rock band U2. All these occupations uh, were very good material for my later work in education, and particularly as an ELT author, although possibly not the all-night transvestite-themed restaurant, um, but the other ones. So, Look back uh, in, your, uh, in, in your life and think of all those odd jobs you did and how they can be put to good use now. So never think of your time uh, as a window cleaner as, as being a waste of time, because at the very least, it will be very useful when you're cleaning a whiteboard. The best of all these jobs was uh, waiting tables. If you think about it, um, your students are like customers at their tables in a restaurant and you're trying to keep a lot of competing people happy in different ways at the same time. You're trying to deliver a menu, uh, often cooked by someone else. You're under horrible amounts of pressure. You're sometimes uh, have a horrible chef in the background. Um, your customers are all at different stages in their meals. They all have different tastes and preconceptions as to what they are going to get from you and they are all there for different reasons, and they are all interacting socially in different ways as you deliver their meals to them. And a good waiter doesn't stand at the top of the restaurant holding forth throughout the evening, trying to be the most fun element in your night out. Next week, uh, for, for your homework, please teach imagining that you are a waiter, and do let me know how you got on. Eventually, the pressure was too much, and I went back to university, this time to Trinity College in my hometown of Dublin. My special subject was Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Again, this was good preparation for work in an A. Kaiwa. And so on graduating from Trinity at the grand old age of 27, the first part of my education came to an end. The second part of my educational journey began when a Japanese restaurant called Yamamori opened in Dublin. I think we call it Yamamori's. Um, it was magic. I went there for lunch and I woke up in Toyota City with one suitcase, having married Yuko, the waitress. Ah, Japan. I had learnt all about Japan at the Children's House Montessori School. We had heard about a land where sad young lovers um, when heartbroken, threw themselves into the crater of an active volcano called Fujiyama. We were wide-eyed at the thought of people who ate raw fish and seaweed. We were fascinated by the whole concept of pearls, 
I, I remember being told about pearls and, and just finding this whole concept fascinating. And, uh, and, and then I found out that Japanese people sent their grannies down, swimming down under the sea uh, to, to get pearls and that they were pulled along by teams of cormorants under the water. Um, so yes, we, we knew a lot about Japan. Uh, and there was also, of course, the dark side of, of what we knew about Japan. Um, my father had spent the war in Burma and every week we, we, we were given extremely racist war comics, um, including my favorite, which was called Union Jack Jackson, uh, who I shared a name with and identified with. Um, joking apart, I love the fact that despite this sort of constant stream of uh, of indoctrination, and this was even in the 70s, that our work in education um, is part of the healing process of these wounds and traumas of the past. And um, it makes what we do very special. So when I arrived in Japan, I needed to get a job. There were very few openings for pillow salesmen or prawn fishermen or parrot dealers. So I looked out for something else. In the Monday edition of the Japan Times, um, there was a couple of pages of teaching jobs, or more, more than a couple, I think there was probably maybe about five pages of teaching jobs. Um, and my eye was drawn to this little advertisement in the corner. The advertisement said, potato club requires teachers. I was like, what was this? What, what is a potato club? Um, so I got in touch and uh, I interviewed and my assessment, uh, which was a trial lesson, was a trial lesson with some real children. And this was the first time I had ever taught anyone. Miraculously, I got the job. I asked the owner, why, why potatoes? And she said, everybody loves them. Um, actually, it turned out that the real children uh, in the trial lesson were her children. Um, and so, in fact, I was given my first job in Japan by uh, some four-year-olds, um, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, they would now be, yes, in their thirties, I guess. No, late twenties. The potato club method uh, was different to the Montessori method. It involved getting through as much stuff as possible in as little time as possible with all the participants participants not wandering around uh, but doing what they were told. But I loved teaching, uh, mainly uh, although I'd like to think it was because I saw myself as part of a bigger educational mission to make the world a better place, uh, but actually because it was really great fun and it had enough leeway for creativity and I was constantly told I had a natural inclination for it. Um, and what a great sensei I was. So this really made my head swell. Um, and it paid the rent on our 1DK apartment. And it was something I could actually do and concentrate on for hours on end. And I'm sure uh, you all know that feeling when you've been teaching uh, for, for half a day or, or a day or, or however long, and you realize that you haven't thought of anything else during that time. Um, which is really, really being in the zone. And I, I, I just loved, I loved every day. Um, and on top of that, I was learning Japanese. I learned all sorts of useful Japanese um, from my students, like how to say sea lion and rhinoceros and otter. Um, unfortunately, I didn't learn any grown up Japanese, which means that when I, uh, when I meet grown up Japanese people, um, I talk like a, a six year old. Um, and can only talk about otters and giraffes, uh, but anyway. Now, despite my own happy time in teaching, uh, there were four elephants in the room, which I'm going to very briefly touch on, uh, but I don't want to dwell on to, to ruin the, the, the fun mood. Um, the first thing is that I was at no time subjected to any checks as to my background before teaching. Um, and I think that's something, I'm not sure if that's still the case, but um, yeah, I had zero training in teaching young learners. So that's the second thing, I had no training whatsoever. And there's, when I think about it now, the basic things that I now know uh, that took me years to find out, um, I really shuddered at the thought. Um, 
The next thing is that I, I, it was years before I made any connection with any sort of teachers organization. And I'll tell you about that later, but as, um, as an organization like JALT, um, I think an important part of what you do is obviously to reach out to people like, like uh, me who just arrived and uh, I could have really benefited or more importantly, my students could have really benefited from being part of a, some sort of network earlier on. And the fourth thing, uh, which I know is changing and for the, for the better, um, is that when I think back of all my time teaching in Japan, all of my colleagues at all of the various institutions I worked at um, in those 10 years were white native speakers. So uh, these little, uh, little big issues, uh, I think obviously um, JALT is an organization playing its part in um, attempting to remedy those. Anyway, life was good for us and um, yeah, it was, it was fun. And one of the funnest things was that the, the boss of the potato club gave us time every week, uh, gave us a few hours to work on material development. And it was during these afternoons that the potato pals um, about children's or rather potato children's everyday lives were born. And uh, we made little black and white books and they were printed in a print shop around the corner. Um, this really changed my life, I guess, that boss giving me those, that, that time to develop the, that passion, uh, which was to turn into my profession. Now, this was one of the first books we made. Um, and, and in it, you can see uh, potatoes, peeling potatoes, mashing potatoes and eating potato cakes. Uh, and when Oxford came along to publish The Potato Pals, this was the, the forbidden uh, book that never made it. Uh, so uh, In the Kitchen with the Potato Pals uh, is now uh, completely censored. Um, one student uh, sticks out in my mind and his name was Yuto. And after coming to, uh, to my lessons for a, week, uh, for, for a year, uh, he basically learned no English whatsoever. And he would just sit there looking blankly at me with a sort of a slightly pleased expression on his face. And he was, there was no trouble, uh, but uh, progress was, was pretty much zero. Um, but then one week he came to class and he sang and uh, sang the entire Pokemon song. And this was the year Pokemon came out. And I, I think there was something like 150 Pokemon characters and he, he knew them all and they all had completely nonsensical names. Um, so I was, I was actually jealous uh, of Pokemon because I thought, why, why can't he, he learn anything from me, but he can learn all these in a week. Um, so then I had the, the bright idea of, of trying to teach Yuto uh, a little bit of English every week through a Pokemon. So we would, uh, we would uh, make sentences, you know, we would be like, hi, hi Yuto, uh, Pikachu is, and uh, he'd be like, yellow, and I'd be like, yes. Um, so yeah, connecting up with his passion for Pokemon, um, really, uh, I'd like to say he is now a Japanese ambassador in Washington, but maybe not. Um, during this time, I, I applied for a position at a junior high school um, after a few years potato clubbing. And uh, yeah, uh, it, I, it took me a couple of years to get that job. Um, my first interview was a complete disaster. I was taken into the headmaster's office, uh, which obviously had bad associations um, for me. Um, and he asked me who my favorite um, Japanese artist was, and I said it was Hakusai, uh, which for you non-Japanese speakers means cabbage. Um, but I didn't get the job that year, but I did get it the following year. So before I left the Potato Club, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to uh, put all my, my wisdom into a, uh, the Potato Club teacher's handbook to pass on to future Potato Club teachers. And I'm gonna shut up now for a second, but I do think that uh, this was probably my finest, uh, my finest moment uh, in education. Uh, I don't think I'd add much to this.
I should probably sing a song or something here. One potato, two potatoes, three potatoes, four potatoes, five potatoes. The bowels. Keep moving. This was a, a bit of an odd one. You are not just an English teacher. I think this I was I was trying to say you can you that there's so much more you can teach apart from just English. This, of course, was the the key. So next thing i find myself in a, a junior high school classroom and it was it was very different um, from the potato club um, i was put in charge of first year a kaiwa yeah uh, um, now a kaiwa was considered a completely different thing in this school from learning actual english uh, and there was a wall of steel between the departments um, which kind of suited everyone one of the old English teachers told me that he hated speaking English and he was so glad he never had to. And another chap told me that he had never been abroad, which is absolutely fine. Uh, but he said that even if he had the chance to go abroad, it would be the last thing that he would want to do. I taught all 10 first year classes during the week. So that was um, on some days, my timetable would be uh, Ichi A. Ichi B, Ichi C, Ichi D, Ichi E, Ichi F, uh, with lunch in between. And the following day would be Ichi G, Ichi H, Ichi I, Ichi J. Um, so this wasn't really a recipe for teacher engagement uh, in some ways, but um, yeah, and some days I'd even have a seventh class after, <laughs> after the six Ichis. Um, but we did projects and one of the projects that we did year in year out really stands out and I'd be pretty confident that the students would remember these two. This was um, the snail mail project, the package project, and so we'd ask the students to bring in little things, uh, little Japanese things, um, so candies and bits and pieces, uh, you know, uh, fans and all sorts of little sort of trinkety things. And then each boy would write a postcard and we sent these um, packages with 40 bits and pieces and postcards in them off to Mongolia, Canada, South Africa and other countries. Um, so it was great fun launching these packages out. I mean, putting the packages together was fun and, and then the posting and the, the addressing them, uh, making sure our, our stamps weren't diagonal. Um, and uh, then, of course, the really exciting thing was when packages started uh, arriving for us during the course of the year. Um, and these were the most exciting classes when the wild, when the, when the wide world arrived in our mailbox and um, the postcards and objects from all these different countries were passed around. So this real world objects, real world engagement and, and real connections with real people um, was just outstanding. And that project is, is still running uh, with a very, a very committed and, and passionate teacher who goes to all the trouble involved in this project, but it really transforms uh, that, those students' um, experience and really it's real communication, which we can do uh, so well. And then um, twice a year, <clears throat> we would watch a movie, um, which was spread out over two weeks. And I wanted them to really get a deep understanding of, um, of American life and culture. Uh, so every, I chose um, two movies, which I think really uh, are important uh, for any young person in Japan to watch, um, which were these two movies. And I hope you, <laughs> you have watched them both, um, both extremely significant pieces of work. Um, over the course of eight years of teaching in Japan, I watched these movies 10 times a year, um, plus, of course, my own personal family viewing. Um, and that means that I watched both of them over 100 times, which is 20,000 minutes of uh, Dumb and Dumber and Groundhog Day, um, or 43 full working days. Um, and that doesn't include the estimated uh, eight years, eight months and 16 days that Bill Murray spent stuck repeating his Groundhog Day. Uh, and that's exactly the length of time I spent teaching at that school. So it all tied together very nicely. 
There was one rather unfortunate incident, though, which I, I want to share with you as a, as a, a caveat. Um, I decided to have the boys do little plays, and I wrote a three-minute version of the Three Billy Goats gruff story, which they performed in groups of four. Um, the, there was a, a father goat, a mother goat, a baby goat, and a troll, and uh, the desk there in the picture is the bridge. And so the goats cross the river one at a time, but the troll jumps up to challenge them as they go, up, oh, jump the troll. I'm going to eat you up. Don't eat me up. My mother's coming, etc. So this was a lot of fun. Um, and as they were ichinense, they, uh, they, they, they would um, do this very happily. So they prepared their, their performances and they performed their performances uh, the following week in these groups. And so there were 400 boys in total. And so this meant I had the pleasure of watching this play 100 times over the course of two days. Um, which I suppose means I've watched it 800 times in eight years. Um, anyway, one year we'd watched 99 groups uh, and then the very last group came and uh, the, the last, uh, the mother goat crossed the bridge, the father goat crossed the bridge and the baby, uh, sorry, the mother goat, the baby goat crossed the bridge, the mother goat crossed the bridge and then the father goat came along. And instead of walking by the desk like every other sensible boy, he jumped up on the desk and the troll, um, instead of just jumping up, the troll grabbed his leg and threw him across the room. Um, and this poor boy was cra crashed into the, the corner of the room and, and was lying there sort of writhing in pain. Um, and meanwhile, the desk had fallen over on top of the troll's foot he was writhing around in pain. So the two of them had to go to hospital and both of them had suffered fractures. Uh, so it is probably uh, a, a unique claim to have through a drama activity broken two children's bones um, in, in, uh, in, in an Eikaiwa lesson. So I do have that to my, to, to my credit. Um, and of course, this was quite a, a serious incident in the school and I had to go and visit the families of these boys and, and apologize. And, and I was taken into the headmaster's office again. And uh, yes, I had to apologize to him, but this time I did not pee on the floor in his office. Um, I also had the chance to work at, um, as a communication teacher in two universities. Um, which pleased my mother very greatly, as she now told all her friends in Ireland that I was a university professor. Um, and again, uh, with these students, the best results I had was uh, breaking them into groups and doing personalized presentation projects. Now, some good friends of mine had written a clever textbook called Scraps, uh, which was all about just this, and it got the conversation flowing. Um, they got to know each other, I got to know them, and they got to polish some conversations which probably uh, they could use in the future. And I wouldn't be surprised if they had kept those presentations and had them in a drawer somewhere. My final teaching job in Japan was uh, teaching retirees at a community college. And I did a course called Great Performers, where each week we would look at a legend of uh, stage or screen and um, this was all very well, but it became quite traumatic because so many of these great performers have terribly tragic lives. And I can still remember the Karen Carpenter uh, lesson, which resulted in all of us just bawling tears. <laughs> it was a complete washout. Um, so anyway, that kind of comes to the end of my teaching uh, career in Japan. Um, the, the next stop was going to be a Kaiwa for the afterlife. Uh, so I called it a day and we went back to Ireland to oversee the collapse of the economy. Now, during my time teaching in Nagoya, two doors had opened that tie in um, with what happened in the next 10 years of my, of my life. Um, one of these doors opened up to the world of ELT publishing um, and the other to the big wide world of study abroad. So what happened was my sister, uh, she who must be obeyed, told me to pop those little potato club books um, into an envelope and I sent them off to New York to Oxford University Press. 
with a little proposal. And a week later, they got back and they said, uh, we would like to, we are very interested in uh, pursuing your potato land readers. Um, so I'd say to all of you, you know, dreams do come true. If you float those little boats down the river, um, things do come back and things do happen. So they asked me to come to Tokyo to meet the editors who were going to be in Japan for the English Teachers of Japan ETJ event. And this was the first time that I had ever been to any sort of English language teaching event. So um, I imagine my surprise when I went and, and sat down in the audience and uh, up on stage, there popped um, four grown-ups uh, all pretending to be different animals, in, complete with bunny ears and whiskers. And these were the leading OUP primary authors. Uh, there was Setsuko Toyama of English Time, and I think she was a kangaroo. There was Kathy Camper and uh, Charles Villainer, who was a dog. Uh, Kathy was a bird, I think. Those are the Everybody Up and Oxford Discover authors. And I think Ritsuko Nakata was a let's go cat. Dear Ritsuko, um, may she rest in peace, and I'm sure she's very much missed by many of you, many of you there. Um, and her, her books have been so, so significant for all of us. Um, the scene was strange enough, but it was made even more peculiar by a very drunk Englishman in the audience. He had obviously come from a nightclub straight directly from Rapongi. Because um, he kept heckling the performers on stage, he kept going, sort of shouting out, "Go, bunny, go!" or "Come on, kangaroo!" and and uh, he was really, uh, yeah, making a show of himself. Um, so um, I remember Charles came down and and said, "Excuse me, uh, would you mind just uh, keeping it down a little bit?" But anyway, so he stormed off this this uh, this chap. But I thought, well, this is a whole new world. And uh, yeah, things moved forward with Oxford and uh, Potato Pals were published. And next thing I was up on stage alongside these legends um, in the annual Oxford um, Kids Club Tour, which, which got us to go uh, all over Japan, which was wonderful. Now I think it's called the Oxford Teachers Workshop Series. Um, but I wasn't allowed to be an animal ever. Um, I always had to be a potato. So the potato suit, yes, given to me by a teacher. Um, it traveled far and wide all over Japan, Korea, China. It even went to Brazil and it served me well. And I, I have it still in my desk, just here. Um, it was even worn one night on the Shinkansen uh, from Osaka to Nagoya um, after a very good Oxford dinner. Um, I often wonder about the man who I was sitting next to and what he told his family when he got home about the big Jaga Imo uh, he had met. So this potato passion led to other writing projects, um, including Everybody Up. I'm proud of this, uh, this that I wrote uh, on every single copy I've written, uh, linking your classroom to the wider world. And if you look at the back of a copy of Everybody Up, you will see that. Um, so I've been able to travel all over the world as part of this Everybody Up project. And although I know there is a discussion around textbooks. When I see how much teachers and kids like them and what valuable support they provide, um, that swings the argument for me. Um, of course, there is no such thing as a perfect textbook and all courses are the best shot at that time at a moving target. And no book will replace passionate and personalized teaching. A good book taught badly will be a bad experience for everyone involved but I'm sure you all know that already. I think of textbooks as like skeletons. Um, they, they get you around from place to place, but you have to hang some other bits on them to get the most satisfying results. Another door that opened up to me was um, a project called Learning Journeys, um, which involved bringing um, Japanese teenagers uh, to um, Ireland, Scotland and the UK. Now I know study abroad isn't for everyone and it isn't possible for everyone, but having had the chance to watch 600 Japanese junior high school students um, in, in action, in, in, uh, in an English environment, um, you really see how travel supercharges this kind of learning um, and obviously not just linguistic learning, but uh, cultural learning and also just 
having a bloody good time. Um, and one of the highlights of every year is, is watching the, the boys come off the, the airport coach and be hugged by the Irish mother uh, who's waiting to take them home for their uh, homestay and, and uh, just the, the horror and, and sort of, the, well, there's a variety of, of responses to this, but it's, uh, it's, it's good fun to watch anyway. And by the time the end of their stay, uh, and you know they're they're leaving, and you know, there's tears, and they've had this, they've had this experience. Um, you really can see the transformation that's taken place. And I think that over the 15 years that this has been happening, there's been a change in uh, in in the 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 people were getting when they first arrive. And I think uh, the whole program is kind of warming up. And I I'm thinking that you know it could be just a change in Japan. Uh, and maybe Nagoya boys are just uh, getting a little bit more internationalized. It's not such a peculiar, terrifying adventure for them. Um, and I think the program itself has created its own culture so that uh, we do a few things that make things uh, run smoother. Um, so in the first years, they'd be like sort of rabbits in the headlights when they were sent off to their families. Now things are getting a little bit um, easier for them. So we started a, a program which was preparing them to come. So this is a four week session, uh, sorry, four, four weeks of sessions where their senpai come and talk to them about, uh, you know, how to, how to be at the disco and how to, uh, you know, um, how to talk to girls or, you know, all these kind of important things that they've, um, uh, you know, how to start a soccer a soccer match and you know basically you know we've just kind of developed a culture which which is getting things moving faster um, the other thing is that the teachers um, are also getting more confident and also by some of them by having come again and again but some of them having just passed on uh, the whole information and uh, this is the fabulous Mr Ito uh, who he's not even an English teacher he actually he's a classical he's a Japanese uh, literature teacher but he's thrown himself into the whole thing so these passionate committed teachers giving their time um, really are uh, changing the world. We also have a, a thing where they do online um, conversation sessions with people in the Philippines before they go. So this means that they've practiced a lot of the conversations. And when they get to Ireland, they do Japan Corner, which we, um, it's kind of a, a version of the package, the snail mail package project. Um, and they show off Japanese things. And this makes them immediately uh, kind of ambassadors for Japan. And, and it makes them the coolest people on the whole program uh, because Japan is so cool. Uh, and all the other kids just, you know, we do this in the first couple of days after they arrive and it just sort of sets them up really nicely. So that's um, learning journeys. Now, if you're interested in um, taking your students abroad anywhere, the one thing I would say, if you haven't done it already, is um, don't think if so-and-so happens, uh, what, you know, what will we do? just presume it's gonna happen because over the course of 15 years, we've had everything has happened and uh, you know, it does happen, uh, you know, so um, yeah, don't, don't, don't try and sort of think nothing's gonna happen or if, if, if we're lucky, nothing will happen. Just think, how can I be ready for it when it happens? Because it will. I also had the chance of uh, bringing a, a, an English school orchestra to Japan and bringing a Japan school orchestra to England, um, both of which were extremely exciting and, and quite goosebumpy projects because they were playing together with counterparts uh, in, in schools, sister schools on the other side of the world. And that was, uh, I think, you know, when you look back and you think, what was the moment where you just thought, wow, this is just amazing, was seeing um, in Oxford, seeing the Japanese school orchestra and the English school orchestra playing together in the Sheldonian theatre, where I should have graduated actually, um, but didn't. Um, but that moment of those goosebumps uh, that you get when you know that something you're doing is just really magical. So um, in the years that uh, since I, I left uh, Japan, as you know, came back to Ireland, 
And um, I've been lucky since then to find my own passion. Um, and I found it in the strangest place and in the strangest way. And it's opened up a whole new series of adventures for me. So if you would like to find out more about the, uh, the final decade in the story, please do join me for my workshop tomorrow. Um, I might bring along my cloak and um, I will be uh, talking about uh, the transformative power of real world student led environmental action. And it would be very nice to see you there. So that's gonna be another early start for me. I'm sure I'll manage. Um, this is my great grandmother. She was born in Australia to a family of musicians and gamblers. Actually, her, her grandfather had won, uh, his horse had won the Melbourne Cup. Uh, now, she crossed the world from Australia back to London, where her great great grandfather, where her grandfather had come from uh, in 1901. And she became a minor celebrity of the day. And I love this quote, I started dancing when I was quite a child and well, I didn't stop and I don't want to stop till I'm old. And that time is a very long way off, Miss Saki. Now, um, unfortunately, <clears throat> four years after this, she passed away um, with tuberculosis. This is my father, he's the brewer. He died in a plane crash when I was five years old and he was 52. So I'm now a year older than he ever was. So I'm going into this unknown territory called 53. Now my talk is for them. So seize the day, get on, be yourself, do that thing, do your thing. Do it with your whole heart every day, but do it not because you might be gone tomorrow, but so that you can truly live today and share that with your students. My, my talk is also for my own kids and all those other people born between cultures or who move between cultures, who are breaking down walls. My daughter, Amy, is in her final year of art school and my son, Kai, is in his final year at Marlborough College, where no doubt he is brewing beer in an attic somewhere. This picture is my revenge on them for never smiling nicely when I ask them. And it was taken in Berlin. That's the Brandenburg gate behind them. We are breaking down walls with peace, love and pizza. Thank you. Please keep in 